Moving back into the five part symmetry, we've got the Solanaceae, which is the nightshade family. And you can see the five part petals with the uh, anthers that are often fused around the, the style of the gynecium. So again, this is a family that has five part symmetry very typically. Uh, sometimes those five petals can be fused into a tube, but sometimes they can be free from each other or just a little bit fused together. Uh, and many members of this family produce a berry for their fruit. And often the leaves are kind of lobed or dissected. And you can see they have that net-like uh, pattern to the veins that identifies them as being dicots. So some representatives of the nightshades, uh, which is uh, the other name for the Solanaceae, include bell peppers, capsicum annuum, uh, and other uh, cultivars of peppers include things like chili peppers. The same species, just selected for different properties, uh, different chemical compounds. Bell peppers are selected for not having a lot of uh, capsaicin in, in them, whereas chili peppers and other uh, much hotter chili peppers are selected for having more and more of the capsaicin and that spiciness, that compound that causes the, the heat that you feel when you eat uh, a chili pepper. Solanum tuberosum is one of our uh, species that is found in, this, in the type genus Solanum. Uh, where are the tubers? Well, here are some tubers. These are um, potato chips, many different forms uh, that we can eat potatoes in that are all lovely and delicious. Uh, French fries and hash browns and on and on and on. The list goes on and on and on. Mashed potatoes. But those are all produced from a, an underground stem, a modified stem called a tuber which the plant uses to store starch, and which we use to uh, garnish hamburgers and Thanksgiving turkey. In the same genus, but a very different species, are eggplants, Solanum melangena, as well as tomatoes, which are Solanum lycopersicum. Uh, all of these are in the same genus. They are sometimes referred to as the nightshade vegetables. Uh, another more infamous member of this family is tobacco, Nicotiana tobaccum, uh, which you can see has these tubular five-part uh, corollas. The petals are fused together into a five-part tube. You can see that leaf venation, these leaves, which uh, are used for producing uh, different forms of consumable tobacco, cigarettes, cigars, uh, snuff, chewing tobacco. All of that comes from the leaves. Next family, the Fabaceae, or the pea family, also known as the legume family. Something we see in most of our legumes found in uh, growing in natively in our part of the world are having a five petals, where we've got one great big petal, and then four other petals that are sort of fused together, but they're all in this uh, zygomorphic or bilaterally symmetrical uh, arrangement. Uh, if you go to the tropics, you're going to find a different type of uh, leguminous flower, but most of them that we see around here are going to have this, this uh, five-petaled bilaterally symmetrical arrangement to them. Uh, and the fruits of the legume family are legumes, different types of legumes or dry dehiscent fruits that open along two sutures, uh, typically. And here's just some of the diversity of different types of legumes that you might find growing out in nature. P. 
Peanuts are an example of a legume. Uh, if you ever wonder what peanuts look like when they're growing, uh, I don't have a picture of that. Black beans as are kidney beans and turtle beans and um, all of your, your uh, beans that you might put into a chili are uh, in this family as well. These are actually the seeds that grow inside of the legumes. So these are uh, seeds rather than fruits. Soybeans uh, are also in this family. And uh, one of the things this family is also well known for is uh, the ability of uh, these plants to fix nitrogen through having symbiotic bacteria. Uh, this, the symbiotic bacteria actually fix the nitrogen but the plant provides a habitat for those bacteria. And because they can take that nitrogen gas from the air and turn it into a form that uh, living organisms can use, like ammonia, uh, many members of the, so of the Fabaceae are rich in protein. And it's a good source of uh, protein for vegetarians, including things like beans and peas and peanuts and soybeans. Here we see some edamame, which are actually the fruits of the soybean with the seeds, the soybeans themselves, inside that we like to eat. Alfalfa is another uh, member of this family, different species in the genus Metacago. Uh, alfalfa is a very important crop for fodder. For horses, if you raise horses, you probably have to feed them some alfalfa hay so they get enough protein in their diet. Uh, one species that we see commonly flowering around here in the fall, which has a different type of um, pea flower, is the mimosa tree, Albizia julibrisson. And again, this is something that you're going to see in the fall. And all of these uh, pink hairs are actually stamens. But in the springtime, you're more likely to encounter eastern redbud, which puts out its flowers before it puts out leaves uh, in the spring. So this is one of the first signs of spring that you'll see around Auburn uh, is eastern redbud. Looking in at the flowers more closely, you can see that they have the very typical pea flower with the five petals that are uh, arranged in this bilaterally symmetrical fashion. The Lamiaceae is the mint family. And members of the mint family also have very strongly bilaterally symmetrical flowers. Uh, the petals are often fused into a tube uh, for uh, pollinators to be able to get in there and affect their pollination. Another thing that we see very commonly in members of the mint family is what we call quadrangular or square stems. And the stems themselves are square and then at each uh, node the, um, the leaves turn 90 degrees. So here we see uh, two leaves emerging and at the next node they're kind of emerging 90 degrees to the previous node and then turning again 90 degrees. So it has this very sort of ornate uh, sort of stair step type uh, appearance to them. And you can see in the gynecium they're typically uh, cleft into four. Um, what are called nutlets are the fruits of the, um, the mint family. A lot of our herbs are in the mint family, things like basil. And you can see uh, these are all the, uh, the, the flowers. Not very many flowers in this picture, but you can see the, the four angled stems that are turning 90 degrees at each node. Uh, rosemary is another member of the mint family. A lot of that growing around Auburn. 
different species of mint, so peppermint, winter mint, spearmint, uh, all in the genus Mentha. As are these three herbs, sage, thyme, and oregano, all members of the mint family. Finally, what is arguably the largest family of flowering plants, uh, like the orchid family, which is arguably the largest family of plants, uh, depending on how you count how many uh, types of plants there are, is it all the species, all the cultivars, things like that, is the daisy family or the Asteraceae. So when you look at a uh, the flowers of the daisy family, typically what you're looking at, which you th might have thought is one flower, is actually many, many flowers all working together to try and look like one great big flower. Uh, and around the edge of that inflorescence, or that group of flowers on a branch, there are individual flowers that are producing a single giant petal relative to the size of the rest of the flowers. Um, that makes it look like you're looking at, for example, a flower that has just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven flowers or, or petals, but that's seven flowers uh, that are producing giant petals. And then in the middle, you've got a different type of flower that is not producing a giant petal, but has a, a, uh, a simpler uh, corolla to it. So, uh, sunflowers, for example, it's really easy to see how all of the little spot specks in the middle of uh, the flower head are actually individual flowers. But this is a pattern that you see repeated in all types of uh, different members of this very, very large and speciose family. Uh, artichokes. You may have looked at an artichoke and wondered what part of the plant that is. It's actually a flower head before it starts to, uh, it's fully mature. So the, these uh, purple bits on this particular uh, group of artichokes are bracts that are surrounding the, uh, the composite head, the inflorescence that's at the center of it. Uh, but you don't want to eat the artichoke once it's actually gone into flower. Uh, you want to get it before it goes into flower. Thistles, uh, this milk thistle being just one representative are also in this family. So each of these um, these purple linear bits up here is a part of an individual flower that makes up this flowering head. Ouch, don't touch it though. It's pointy. Uh, a more pleasant member of the aster family, the daisies, are chrysanthemums. Uh, chrysanthemum means golden flower and there are many many different uh, varieties that have been grown for uh, ornamental use. Believe it or not, lettuce is not closely related to cabbage at all, even though the growth form is similar in that it produces a head. Uh, but like with cabbage, we harvest lettuce before uh, it can mature into um, a large plant before it could go into uh, flower and fruit. But if we were to let it go into flower and fruit, what we'd find happens is it uh, goes through a process called bolting, where the stem will elongate and it's not in a head anymore, and then it starts producing this milky latex um, that tastes very bitter. So once your lettuce bolts, it's no longer any good to eat. Um, and then after it's bolted, it will produce flowers and fruits. And the flowers and fruits of lettuce look an awful lot like its very close cousin, the dandelion. So in a dandelion, again, we've got a composite head where each of these um, darker yellow bits sticking up here is actually the stigmas of an individual flower. 
and they often curl up and they look like little curly cues and they're awfully cute if you look at them through a magnifying lens or under a microscope. Now when a dandelion or other members of this family have been pollinated, they will lose their petals, they will lose the corolla, and here you can see some corollas that have actually uh, fallen off or absized already, leaving behind the fruits. So these bristles here are a highly modified uh, calyx or set of sepals that act to help disperse the seed which is inside the fruit down here which is uh, in the, the daisy family most typically and a keen. Here's another type of uh, wild daisy called Coreopsis. And you can see each one of these facets on here is an individual flower. And these flowers, these flowers on down here are producing a different type of uh, corolla. This is just one very strongly um, bilaterally symmetrical flower to make it look like this entire thing is just one big flower instead of lots and lots of little bitty flowers. Here's another example of a close cousin of um, dandelions and lettuce and you can kind of make out on these flowers on the edge, how they have these five teeth along there, which are where the five petals of the ancestral plant fused together. You can even see it more strongly here. Here's a, uh, another member of the family that has fewer flowers in the composite head, but it makes it very much more clear that you've got stigmas uh, with the anthers actually fused in the tube around uh, the stigma, the, or the style. And you can see each of these with these five teeth on here representing the five petals that fuse together. And that's my last slide. So those are the ten uh, families of flowering plants, just to give you a little sampling of the great diversity of this phylum and its great success uh, in the uh, Cenozoic era, uh, enabling it to become the most uh, abundant and uh, dominant form of plant life our planet has ever seen.